So three Olympics, 12 Olympic medals. It has been an incredible journey thus far, and there were a lot of stumbles and challenges along the way. You know, just like Bob talked about with Michael, we have all had a lot of challenges. Back in 1999, I was a junior in high school and considered one of the up and coming stars of USA Swimming. I was the American record holder in the 100 yard backstroke and the only person to have ever qualified for Olympic trials in every event. I had already won a national title and had already been on my first national team and so going into the 2000 Olympic trials, I was considered a favorite to make the Olympic team in at least one event, if not two or three. Just about a year before that Olympic Games, after a particularly challenging workout, um, I woke up with the most excruciating pain in my left shoulder. And I went back to bed and then went to practice the next morning. I could barely lift my arm. You know, we did tarps in the morning. Growing up in Northern California, you have to cover the pool. Um, I think it was about February, so it was still really cold out. Mid to high 20s, low 30s. It's awesome getting in the pool at that time. Um, I could barely lift my arm, let alone take a stroke uh, in the pool. After visiting several doctors, I learned that I had a torn labrum and that I would likely need surgery to fix that problem. And then on top of that, stay out of the water for four, five, six weeks unheard of in our sport. We don't take breaks. Um, when you train 50 weeks out of the year, six, maybe seven days a week, five plus hours a day, you're not gonna take a break. You can't take a break. Taking a break is not an option. So I was already kind of an emotional 16-year-old with under a lot of pressure, and you add a debilitating injury on top of it, I was a basket case. So I struggled in practices and trained the best way that I knew how, but my body wasn't allowing me to train the only way that I knew how. Um, back then, it was, I was part of the you know, old school training method of just go hard, 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 as long as you possibly can, and then go hard some more. Um, I trained you know, a dozen workouts a week, um, adding up to 80,000 to 100,000 meters a week. And I don't know how many of you guys are swimmers out there, but that's 50 to 60 miles in the pool a week on top of you know going to school and doing all that other fun, fun stuff. Um, that's difficult enough when you're completely healthy, but when you have a bum shoulder, that's impossible. So fast forward to the Olympic trials in 2000. I finished fourth in my best event, the 200 IM. That was my best event at the time the 200 IM, and you need to get first or second to qualify for the Olympic team. So I was completely devastated. My Olympic dreams, you know, I, I like Michael, when I was six years old, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games. Um, I had no idea what that meant at the time, but that was my goal. And my dreams at that point, my Olympic dreams were over before they had even started. At that point, I was completely burnt out. I hated swimming. I resented the fact that I had dedicated so much of my life to my sport. And working my butt off for you know 50 weeks out of the year and, and working hard, this is where it got me. I would have quit had it not been for the fact that I knew swimming was my ticket to a free education. I knew that I had a full scholarship waiting for me at the University of California at Berkeley. And that's the only reason I continued to swim. And that's where I met my current coach, Terry McKeever, who changed my life. She taught me and my teammates that swimming was not only about the end-all goal. It was about the journey along the way and what you learned along the way. It was about the experiences. And her nurturing style, coupled with this change in perspective, was exactly what I needed. She focused on smarter training as opposed to the volume heavy old school method of just distance, 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 training longer, hard, hard, hard. Trust me, we did still train hard, but um, everything we did in practice was to prepare ourselves for our race. If you practice perfect technique, perfect starts, perfect turns, perfect breakouts, day in, day out, thousands and thousands of hours, you're gonna execute it when the time comes. You know, it goes back to what Cynthia was talking about, about muscle memory. 
if you force yourself to be mindful in practice and practice perfection, you could rely on your preparation when you're in an intense competition and the lights are on and you're on the Olympic stage. So being present in the moment became a big theme in my training. It wasn't just about going long and hard, it was training smarter while training hard. So what does training smarter mean? Well, many people are turned off of swimming because of its monotony. You know, we often joke that your head is underwater and it's, it can be a lonely sport even though you do train with a team. So your head is underwater, it's just you, that voice in your head, and the black line for hours and hours and hours, five, six hours a day. So when I was younger, I got through those 50 or 60 miles in the pool by daydreaming or singing a song in my head. And there was a complete disconnect of mind and body. I worked on the physical side of training and I wasn't really working on the mental side. I learned as I got older that being present in the moment was the most effective use of my time. This allowed me to train myself physically but also mentally. So no matter what I'm doing in the pool, or in the gym, I am constantly asking myself why. Why am I doing this exercise? What is the purpose of this exercise? Is there a way that this could be done better? Is there a more efficient way to, to fix my technique? I'm constantly scanning my body from head to toe in workout, which is, you know, that's a mental workout in itself, just being so present in the moment. But I'm constantly scanning myself and trying to figure out ways to be more efficient. It goes back to the theme of practicing for success. I'm practicing to be the most successful that I could possibly be day in and day out. You know, other great people before me have said that luck is the meeting of opportunity and preparation. And I truly believe in that. I think that practicing is preparing myself for the opportunity to get lucky. You know, we set big goals for ourselves and we hope it's when the lights are the brightest and we're on the Olympic stage. And so we prepare for that moment and hope to get lucky through practice. So thinking outside the box and training outside the box were also themes in our training. At Cal, the first time I did anything other than swimming, I, I, we started training kickboxing, running, yoga, Pilates, body surfing, weight training, all these crazy things outside the pool. And that was unheard of a decade ago. You know, we, you know, we swimmers like to call it dry land. Anything out of the water is dry land. And um, no one was doing that much dry land back then. But our, our philosophy at Cal was that anything that challenged you physically, challenged you to be a better athlete, will automatically make you a better swimmer if you're present and mindful. Just like Dan was saying, you have to be practicing mindfully. So this type of training was much more intense mentally, but surprisingly, it was a lot easier on my body. There was a lot less wear and tear on my body. Over time, my, my shoulders healed and I was much stronger. After training with Terry for several months, I began to find my passion for swimming once again. I was no longer burnt out, and although I had the occasional shoulder issue, I I wasn't in nearly as much pain as I was before. And I did that without actually having to get surgery, which was great. Uh, not surprisingly, my races improved and I was swimming fast again, but was more surprising that I was swimming faster than ever, ever before. And the difference of 12 years is insane. 12 years goes by, I'm now a three-time Olympian, two-time Olympic captain, and 12-time medalist. I went from hating the sport of swimming to absolutely loving it and getting to call this my job. I love being a professional athlete. And oftentimes I'm asked, do you see swimming as a job? And yes, I do, I do. Um, but I think when people are asking me that, they're focusing on job and the negative connotations of a job. You know, swimming is a job for me in that that's how I pay my bills. You know, I'm 30 years old and I still get to do this and call, call it a job. I work out all day, travel the country and the world, and get to represent my country. Just because it's a job doesn't mean I can't love it. You know, do I love it all the time? No, absolutely not. 
There are times I hate it, but for the most part, I love it. It's, co it's called work for a reason. You have to work at it day in and day out. So, you know, when the alarm goes off at 4.30 a.m., do I wake up with a giant smile on my face? No, I hate it. But that gets me prepared for achieving my goals and getting, you know, quote unquote, lucky. Do I love walking out onto the pool deck in a swimsuit in the pouring rain when it's 40 degrees out? No. Do I love the unannounced drug tests constantly? No. There are many things that I absolutely do not like and despise about swimming, but for the most part, I love it. While all my friends um, have, you know, quote unquote, real jobs, this is what I get to do. I get to focus on being the healthiest I could be. I get to watch the sunrise every morning. I get to spend the majority of my days in the fresh air, even if that fresh air has the distinct tinge of chlorine. Um, I think I carry that around with me. My skin still smells of chlorine. Um, but I feel blessed. Like, I feel so blessed to be able to be here and, and call myself a professional athlete. And I choose the word blessed and not lucky because I feel blessed that I was given a body that is healthy enough to be competitive and to be athletic. Um, you know, just like all those reports on Michael, you know, I have long arms, and, but I'm not particularly tall. I wasn't blessed with any, you know, specific physical attribute. It was the choices that I've made throughout my life and throughout my career that, that got me here. And, um, yeah, I am very, very proud of those choices, and it's a lifetime of choices. Of all my Olympic successes, the memories of my 100 bet backstroke in Beijing are particularly clear. I was dominating that year in that race. I broke the world record in a Grand Prix leading up to the Olympics, which was unheard of for me, and I was the defending Olympic champion. In a Olympic competition, you swim prelims, then semis, and then finals. And in the semis, the, one of my biggest competitors ended up breaking my world record and was seated first going in, into finals. She was a silver medalist in Athens while I was the gold medalist, and she was having a phenomenal year. And many people thought that she was going to knock me off that top podium and win gold. And although I was nervous, I stayed calm as humanly possible and focused on the task at hand. I knew that if I executed everything that I had practiced, that I would be successful. So I just focused on my strengths and just had faith that I had done everything to prepare myself for that moment. So walking out onto the Olympic stage is probably one of the most terrifying experiences. And I've been there 12 times. It's still terrifying. Um, you wait in the ready room for tw 20 minutes before your race with your fellow competitors, and everyone has their own routine. For me, it's dressing up you know, in a parka designed for the tundra with my Ugg boots, and I go in the corner, lay down on the ground as close to a wall, put up my feet, close my eyes, and focus on relaxation breaths, and then my race plan. And I knew and, and pictured what that plan was going to be. I knew that the last, you know, last few meters of, that, of my race, I was probably going to feel a lot of pain, so I would focus on strategies to deal with that pain and, and deal with the pressure of the situation. So I remember walking out onto the deck, and you have a camera right in your face. And you look up to your left, to your right, 18,000 fans in the, the competition venue, millions of people wait, waiting and watching and cheering you on at home. And they're probably more nervous than I and my family. They're, they're wreck at meets. But um, you just have to rely on the hours and hours and hours that you put in and practice. So I remember jumping into the water and setting my feet. And I forget the first 50 meters of that race, but I remember pushing off the wall and doing my underwater works. We do 15 meters underwater. And I remember being able to hear the crowd just go insane. And I could tell that I was quite a bit ahead. And then I knew that I was fading. <laughs> I spent a lot of energy on that first 50. So what I did was just focus on, on my race, focus on keeping my head still, even though my lungs and legs were completely burning, and then focus on my finish. So I dove back, and with as much energy as I could muster, I, I hit that wall. 
And then I pumped my fist when I looked at the, at the scoreboard. And then for a moment I worried that I read the scoreboard wrong and <laughs> then you know, a few seconds went by and I realized I didn't embarrass myself completely in front of millions of people and let the situation wash over me. The feeling of winning an Olympic gold medal is amazing. When you get out of that pool, it's absolutely amazing. I still remember getting out, out of the water, waving to the crowd. I did my immediate press. I came back to the, the team area where my coach was waiting for me, Terry, and she was just uncontrollably sobbing. And so I gave her a hug, and I started crying, which I'm not really generally an emotional person, but I was crying, I, I just defended my Olympic medal, so I was giving myself a little bit of a break. I was crying. I got myself together, then went to the medal ceremony, and my teammate, Margaret Holzer, she got bronze, and it was her first Olympic medal, and then Coventry got silver, the defending silver medalist. Um, and so we heard the national anthem, and we watched the flags being raised, and I looked to my left, and my teammate, she was crying out of happiness. And then once again, the waterworks started with me, and I started crying, just a little bit. And it was like, oh, okay, this is weird. And then I started crying because I was crying, and this whole vicious <laughs> cycle just started. And, you know, you, you see people at the Olympics, and you see people sobbing. I was like, I would never be that person, and I was, just, I was being that person. And so that got in my head. And as we did the victory lap, I just was starting to cry and cry and cry. And my eyes were bloodshot and snots coming out of my nose and my face is all splotchy and those are the pictures that haunt me. <laughs> um, but it's a moment that I will never forget. And it represents all the blood, sweat and tears and a long-term goal coming to fruition. And it represents all the challenges that I've had in my career. And I, I will never, ever, ever forget that moment. And so I'm incredibly proud of my accomplishments, so I'm gonna continue swimming for a little bit longer. And I just had my 30th birthday. It doesn't get any easier as you get older, but um, I'm gonna rely on everything that I've learned in my career and continue to practice and prepare. So if I could leave you with a couple of my favorite quotes, um, one of them is from Abraham Lincoln, and it's, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. And then Alexander Graham Bell, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. And then Tony Robbins, the meeting of preparation with opportunity generates the offspring that we call luck. So thank you very much for having me.